people to share. Okay, and Susan Gilliland, would you please come on down and introduce our speaker for us? Sure, I'd be happy to, Ron. Um, good evening, everyone. It's my real honor and pleasure to introduce Lance Benner as tonight's Los Angeles Birders speaker. Um, some of you may know that Lance is a planetary scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he specializes in radar imaging of near-Earth asteroids. But some of you may also know Lance for his significant contributions to eBird and as the extraordinary coordinator of America's Birdius County. But to most of us, Lance is our go-to owl and crossbill guy. And we know to alert Lance to owls and crossbills when we see or hear them. And of course, we get a recording or we don't come home. Lance has been recording bird sounds since 2009 and has made many significant contributions to audio databases, including Xenocanto and the Macaulay Library through eBird. His recordings have been used in research papers, books, educational nature programs, smartphone apps, and for development of sound recognition software. We're really very pleased to have Lance with us tonight as part one of a two-part webinar workshop. And on that note, so to speak, let's please welcome Lance. All right, thank you very much, Susan. That was, uh, that was very kind of you, very kind words. Um, so we're going to uh, try some uh, kind of multimedia things here. Uh, we're going to be using PowerPoint, um, but I'll be switching from that um, over to uh, Raven Light and Audacity uh, to play some recordings and to show you how they all work. So there'll be some switching back and forth. Um, and let's see. So um, I guess without, uh, without any further ado, let's get started. So yeah, so this, uh, this particular talk is one I originally developed for the, uh, the, the Young Birders uh, group at the Pasadena Audubon Society about three years ago. And uh, so I've now given this talk a couple of times, most recently for, for uh, Pomona Valley Audubon uh, last December. Um, so I'm going to give you an introduction to uh, a number of things about how to record bird sounds uh, using, in this particular talk, primarily phones, but also describing a number of techniques and introducing sonograms and introducing uh, um, some of the key software. So in the bigger picture, why would you want to do this? Um, I mean, who cares? Why, why bother? Well, there are a number of reasons, and we'll go into those in detail, but uh, we'll, 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 in, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about why this is something you might be interested in. And then we're going to uh, go through a brief introduction of audio spectrograms, which are commonly known as sonograms. I'm um, going to say uh, some things about recording bird sounds with cell phones and show that, yes, you can, in fact, do it, and it is quite useful, um, although there can be some, um, some limitations depending on how you do it. And then we're going to spend some time uh, playing with the uh, Raven Light and Audacity uh, sound editing software. And uh, then we'll go into some uh, suggestions for how to get better uh, recordings. And uh, if we have enough time, we, we may even uh, do, go through an example of um, editing a file and uploading it to Xenocanto. Um, the, uh, the things on the bottom of this slide uh, labeled more advanced topics, those are going to be the things we'll discuss during the, um, the Zoom talk next week. Uh, we really don't have enough time, I don't think, to do all of that uh, in about 45 to 50 minutes. And so we'll save that for, uh, for next week's uh, uh, presentation. So. Um, so why, why would somebody want to record bird sounds? Well, there can be a number of reasons. Um, um, in my particular case, um, one of the things that really got me interested in this is that some of their songs are just utterly beautiful. Um, for example, thrushes. Um, having grown up in the northern uh, New England, uh, I heard lots of thrushes when I was, uh, when I was young, uh, particularly hermit thrushes, veeries, um, and wood thrushes. Uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, Swainson's thrush and Bicknell's thrush in northern Vermont. Um, and it, it really just has captured my interest ever since grade school. Um, as, a, as, as part of um, recording bird sounds, it really helps learn the vocalizations. Um, it, it's really expanded the, the, uh, the number of sounds that I know considerably in the process of recording them. And so this is, can really you know, help with your identification skills. And if you can identify birds by sound, that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. Um, it's, it's particularly useful if you're doing bird surveys for things like a breeding bird survey. Um, but it's also just a lot of fun. And if you're birding in places with lots of vegetation, it will help you 
identify things when you can't see them. Um, of course, if you record bird sounds, then that enables you to, to, uh, to document rare species. Um, quite often, getting a sound recording is just as good or even better than getting a photograph. And it's often easier than getting a photograph. Um, one of the things that is of particular interest to me is using recordings to do some uh, simple, relatively low-level scientific research. Um, and uh, for example, by understanding red crossbills and evening grosbeaks, which have different uh, populations based on their flight call types. There's still a great deal we don't know about these species, and recording them is a really great way to figure this out. Um, so we, you can make really useful contributions uh, to our body of knowledge of bird vocalizations with, without expensive, really expensive equipment. Although granted, many cell phones these days are expensive, but if you have a cell phone, you can already make valuable contributions. Or for, you know, 70, 80, 100 dollars, you could get a dedicated recorder and get some very nice recordings. Many bird sounds are poorly known, uh, particularly regional dialects, um, and so this is a great opportunity to do citizen science. There's, there's really a lot of low-hanging fruit that you can, uh, that you can uh, address by recording birds. Um, one of the things that I take considerable satisfaction from doing is uploading recordings to eBird and to Zeno Canto. And that's because this helps get them out there and then they get used and they, they make uh, additional contributions in some ways, in ways that I never even envisioned. Um, and they're really analogous to museum specimens. Um, so when you upload a recording, it can turn out to be important in the future in ways that you really kind of can't envision when you, when you get the recording and upload it. Um, and for example, um, white-throated sparrows. There was a recent uh, a paper that was, um, that was published that was very prominent. I, I regret that I don't recall the, the names of the first author, but it was describing how the songs of white-throated sparrows have been changing um, in the populations moving from the western part of the continent over to the northeast. And part of how they tracked the changes was by using recordings that had been uploaded to eBird and also to Zeno Canto, including some of mine. Um, and so when I put those recordings into those databases, I had no idea that they were documenting a very short period, very short time frame change in the song of that species. Um, recording birds is an excellent way to monitor nocturnal flight calls. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this in the next, um, next talk. Um, and um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to address this in a dedicated seminar um, at some point in the not too distant future. So in the bigger scheme of things, recording sounds, it really has made birding for me uh, considerably more rewarding than it was before. Um, it's helped me learn a lot more vocalizations. I've stumbled into lots of sounds that I didn't know that even common species uh, will make. And um, in addition, not a lot of birders are recording, and so you can really make valuable contributions pretty easily um, by recording sounds. <laughs> So some examples, um, I've mentioned a few of these already, but, um, but for example, Red Crossbills, uh, Walter Zaliga, Kathy Ellsworth, John Garrett, and I published a paper in Western Birds on uh, Red Crossbill flight call types in Southern California. And we, we did that by recording them and um, got the first documented evidence of types two and three. Um, Ed Pandolfino, Nathan Peeplo used some of my white-breasted nuthatch recordings to map out different populations of those. And, um, <clears throat> that has actually led to proposals that these might be completely separate species. Uh, it turns out that the contact zones are relatively limited, uh, at least as currently known, in a couple of places in the western slope of the Sierra Nevada. Um, some of my recordings were used um, in the most recent version of the Birds of North America paper, Red Crossbills, by Craig Bankman and Matt Young. I uh, mentioned, already mentioned the white-throated sparrows. Um, a number of recordings that I've uploaded to Zeno Canto have appeared in one or both editions of the Peterson Field Guides to Bird Sounds by Nathan Peeplo. Uh, there are now two books in that series from Eastern and Western North America. Um, one of the sonograms that we got of a Type 2 Red Cross Bill appeared in the LA County Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, the, um, <clears throat> some of the recordings have been used on the iBird Pro smartphone app. Um, as as uh, Susan briefly mentioned in the intro, um, some of the recordings have also been used for uh, help with developing bird recognition software. And this is something that's probably ongoing with the folks at the Cornell Lab. They're, they're expanding the, uh, the Merlin app to do sounds now, uh, you know, and so forth. And, um, you know, recordings that I upload to Zeno Canto, people keep telling me that they use them when they're out in the field, because you can bring those up using a smartphone, as long as you have cell phone service. Um, and in addition, um, it turns out that some of my spotted owl recordings have been used uh, by US Forest Service surveyors. Um, 
in California and Oregon uh, for several years. I didn't know that until just recently. So um, let's, let's take a, a step uh, in a different direction and uh, look at, okay, how do birds actually make sounds? So the birds have, um, you know, a, a basically organs similar to the human larynx, but in the bird it's called a syrinx. And in birds they have two of them. They're located at the top of the lungs, just below the trachea. And that's what this figure here illustrates. So this is a figure from Nathan Peoples' book. And there's, there's one syrinx in each, basically each, each side of the top of each lung. And one of the amazing things that birds can do is they can make two different sounds, one with each one of these syringes, simultaneously. Now, not all birds do this. Many of them don't. But there are some birds that do this on a regular basis. Uh, thrushes, for example. And, um, you know, it's, uh, <coughs> excuse me. it's something that thrushes are particularly noted for. It's part of what gives their, their songs such a, a beautiful musical aspect to them. Um, so I, I mentioned that we're going to talk about sonograms. So uh, he, here's an example of one. Um, so we're going to say a little bit about the sonogram itself, and then I'm going to uh, switch over um, to a different program, and we'll, we'll play it and listen to it. So this is um, a sonogram is basically a graphical representation of bird sounds. Um, the horizontal axis is time, and uh, the units are given at the top of the figure. They're in seconds. Um, so this one goes from about four seconds into this particular recording until just over nine seconds. The vertical axis is frequency, which you could also think of as pitch. Um, very low frequencies, very low frequencies would be down here. And very high frequencies that would be close to the edge of uh, people's hearing would be up here around 10 kilohertz or perhaps even above. Um, on the sonogram itself, these dark things, those are sounds. The darker the sound, the louder it is, at least as shown in a sonogram in a grayscale or black and white version of a sonogram such as the one I've shown here. Um, so the principal sound for this particular bird, this is a barred owl recorded in Maine, um, are the bottom ones. And they are low frequency sounds, um, and we'll hear those. And then these other ones that are above over here, those are basically uh, harmonics. They're, they're somewhat analogous to like different octaves if you're familiar with, say, playing a piano. Um, so having looked at that, let's, um, let's see. So I stopped sharing that, and let me share a different a different screen and see if we can do this. Okay, so you should all now be seeing um, Audacity showing a barred owl uh, sonogram. It's actually the one we just saw in PowerPoint, but now we're going to listen to it. And so here we go. So this was uh, using a program Audacity, and it had a scrolling sonogram, which was that green vertical line that went across the screen. Um, we'll uh, show more examples of that later. Um, so th this particular bird was recorded at a range of roughly 100 feet um, in a yard in a, in a uh, <coughs> excuse me, rural area just outside of Bangor, Maine, um, at, uh, at Kathy's uh, son's house, Cooper Ellsworth, about three years ago. Okay. So let's go back to PowerPoint. Um, let's see, there it is. And we'll start this back up. Okay, so that was Bardow. So sonograms in some ways are analogous to sheet music. So over on the left here is a, a figure, again, lifted from Nathan Peoples book with the first few notes of the Star Spangled Banner, Banner, excuse me. And then over on the right shows how this would look if you turn this into a sonogram. And the general pattern is similar. I mean, time goes from left to right, and, and pitch goes from bottom to top. Uh, here's another example, um, in this case from the uh, Warbler Guide by Tom Stevenson and Scott Whittle, with a, a sonogram representation at the top of row, row, row your boat. Um, and uh, so on the bottom part of the figure is a, a nice illustration from their book um, saying a little bit more about what an individual 
sound in a sonogram is. Um, so this is showing something that rises in pitch and then drops. And the part that rises is thinner, so it's not quite as loud. The part that drops is wider, and so that's louder. Um, so it's rising up in pitch, and then it's dropping down in pitch as a function of time. So let's uh, listen to some more examples of some, uh, some recordings. And so we're going to get out of the PowerPoint again, and we're going to switch over to uh, hearing some other things uh, recorded in various places, um, mostly actually not from this particular um, area. Let's see. Um, all right, this is going to be a common loon. In this case, it was recorded at a lake in central Maine, um, about 20 minutes west of Augusta, the state capital. Yeah, there are at least two birds vocalizing. Okay, so that was a common loon. Um, let, me, do, 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 let me close that down and we will switch over to something else. Okay, let's see How about this one. Okay, so this next one, um, this is going to be an owl and it's called a rufous-legged owl. This is a, um, a bird in the Strix genus, the same genus with spotted and great gray owls. And it lives in South America. This is one that Kathy and I were fortunate enough to find on a birding trip in central Chile five years ago. <laughs> So that was one of the sort of auditory highlights of that whole trip. Just an utterly amazing, amazing experience. There, were, there was a male and a female vocalizing um, in that particular recording. Um, so let's try something uh, a little bit closer to home next. Um, this is going to be a Clark's Nutcracker uh, that was recorded up near Mammoth Lakes about three years ago. So this was in one of the picnic areas up by the lakes themselves. And so uh, there were other people around as well as uh, you could hear Kathy's voice and my voice and a couple of other people. Um, let's do another one more example, then we'll go on with the rest of the talk. Um, so this next one is going to be a wood thrush. Uh, this was also recorded in central Maine, um, pretty much the same place where I recorded the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the common loon that we heard a moment ago.
Actually, before we do that whole thing, let me show you a little bit more of it. Um, going to increase the uh, the top range of the frequencies, so you should be able to see this. So another place where there were some people around at the same time that I got the recording. Um, a very common bird in the Northeast. And so, so these, these recordings were obtained with um, um, some basically a very simple setup, relatively simple setup, and um, <coughs> excuse me, um, a recorder and uh, an external microphone. And, um, you know, a setup that at least in this case, was a few hundred dollars, although you could have gotten very nice recordings without that. So as I mentioned, one of the research things that we've addressed um, that, um, with this equip very simple equipment has been recording red crossbills. And so here's a, a very brief little uh, primer about that. Over here on the left is a series of, of individual um, flight calls from uh, eight different types of red crossbills that were identified as of about 25 years ago. And over on the right here is a map of where recordings of each one of these, uh, type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, had been obtained. And a notable thing about these was at the time of this, this pa paper was published, there were no recordings in Southern California. And we know they were here, but we just didn't know what they were. And so in late 2010, Walter Zaliga and I uh, started trying to record these. And uh, we teamed up with Kathy and, uh, and John and managed to get a number of recordings in the beginning in January of 2011. And so here, here some of them are. Uh, and it turns out that the first few we got were all type twos. Um, and in this particular case, two of them were at Table Mountain, and then the other one was in the San Jacinto Mountains. Uh, and we published this in 2014 in, uh, in Western Birds. Um, here's an example. In this case, this is a, uh, an animated version of a sonogram. Um, and, and these are um, a flock of red cross bills on Pine Mountain in Ventura County, which is uh, a short distance uh, north of Ojai. Yeah, so there was quite a few of them. There was several, oops, several dozen of them. Um, we also found some type 3 red cross bills. This uh, happened at Pear Blossom Park in 2012. This is a screen grab of a scrolling sonogram from eBird. It's a little jerky at the beginning, so it's not your computer. It doesn't seem quite synchronized. So you could see how different those uh, those different types sounded relative to the twos that we heard before. And so far, types two and three are the only ones that have been documented in Los Angeles County. There could be others, so but we just haven't found them yet. So, so what kind of devices can you use to get recordings like this? Well, dedicated sound recorders, of course, but you can use other things too. Um, cell phones, because most modern smartphones have a record, uh, like a memo record um, capability. Um, if you don't have that, or if you're don't have your phone with you, you can also use cameras because many cameras shoot video and you can extract sound files from the audio part of the video, either using an SLR or a point and shoot camera or a video camera. Um, now having said this, the, the videos that I personally have extracted from cameras haven't been as, I mean the sounds haven't been as good as the ones I've been able to get from cell phones or certainly not from dedicated sound recorders, but they're better than nothing and they're surprisingly capable, um, that is, the, the camera videos. So I mentioned using a phone. Is it really 
possible to use a smartphone to get a decent recording? Uh, and the answer is yes, it, it most certainly is. Um, and so we're going to pause PowerPoint for a sec, and I'm going to show you that. So uh, let's see. So can you guys see me, Ron, Mark? Is this, can you just nod if you can? Okay. So so here's my here's my smartphone. This is an iPhone uh, 8 Plus. It's uh, not the most modern one, but it's good enough. And so I have a couple of apps on here. Um, one of them is simply the Voice Memo app. And so in order to record something with this, this this comes up. This is an app that's just built on the phone when you buy it. You just push this button, and now it's recording. And you, you can see on the bottom there how it's scrolling along and the amplitude of the sound is varying as I talk. This is the easiest way to record something using an iPhone. And presumably there's something similar on the other kinds of phones, but this is the kind of phone I have, so it's what I'm most familiar with. And so then I just hit the red button and it stopped. So easy enough. And then you can, you know, give it a name and so forth. And if you want to get the phone from the, uh, get the uh, recording from your phone to your computer, you can email it to yourself. Um, I think voice memo that now allows you to, you can also use AirDrop. Um, you might be able to use, use Dropbox and so forth. Um, Another uh, app that I like a lot is one called um, uh, Rody Rec. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. Rody, yeah, there's a cat, Mr. Big. Um, Rody is a, um, a software company, software and hardware company. Excuse me for a moment. Here we go. Um, I, I think in, uh, in Norway. And um, so let's see. Get this back up. There's that. Da -da -da. And so you push the button, and then you hit record. So again, it's the, the red button, and now it's recording. It's that simple. And um, so this is a much more capable um, phone app than the voice memo app that comes with the phone. There's a free version of this, but I plunked down $4 to, to get this one so I don't have to sift through the ads. Um, and then you hit stop, and it stops. And uh, again, you can get this to your to your computer by emailing it, by airdropping it, by using Dropbox and other kinds of uh, file sharing things. You don't need to actually use a, a, a cord to plug in from one device to the other. It's easier if you don't do that. One of the nice things about this, this app is that it enables you to record WAV files. And WAV files are uncompressed. They're analogous to raw images on a camera. Whereas the Voice Memo app is compressed and there's information that's simply gone. And we'll, we'll see examples of that. So the last app I want to talk about is one that's even more complicated and sophisticated. Um, it's called Voice Record Pro. Now there are a couple versions of it, and this, this, the, uh, let's see, let me, uh, let me adjust the brightness a little bit. That might be a little bit too bright. Um, okay, let's try this again. Do -do -do. Voice Record Pro. So I hope that's a bit more visible. It, this is one of a number of screens that it that it has, and so I push the red button, and this brings up a series of of things that I can configure on it. Things like the number of bits, how fast it samples, and I, I have it set to sample at 48 kilohertz or 48,000 samples per second. It's going to record a wave file, which is again uncompressed, and then there's a little button up here that says start. You hit start, and it's recording, and you should be able to see the little levels at the top you know, varying as I talk. In fact, they're for the most part saturated because the phone is right next to me. And then you can stop this and it'll save your file. And you, you can even do manipulation to the file as you're going along, um, or actually after you recorded it. And then uh, like amplify it and change formats and stuff. And then you can transfer this over to your computer. Again, by email, you can text yourself, you can you know, Dropbox it, do all kinds of stuff. Um, Lance, regarding the, yes. Can you repeat the name of the apps people missed, especially the Rody app? And so maybe spell it. Apps. So I have a slide in a moment that will show exactly that. Um, also, also while you. while we're stopped, are you familiar with BirdNet, and do you have an opinion on it? Um, so I'm afraid that the audio just dropped, and I could not hear most of what you said, Ron. Uh, we have a question. Are you familiar with BirdNet from Cornell? And do you have an opinion on it? Um, no, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, go back to the talk. And um, so you should now all be seeing.
PowerPoint. Um, and so, okay, so here, here was an example of, um, of a recording obtained with the phone. Um, in this case, it's a Cooper's Hawk that was I recorded basically in my neighborhood a couple of years, like three years ago. And so in this particular recording, again, the, the frequency or pitch is on the vertical axis, time is on the horizontal axis. And you'll notice that there are white spots here, quite a few white spots. Those are compression artifacts. Um, basically, information is simply gone. This was recorded using the voice memo app on an iPhone, and in particular, an iPhone 5S, which is a, several years old now. Um, and so let's, uh, let's, let's basically quickly listen to this so you can see it and hear it. Now, it, it turns out that when you hear it, it's not, it's not actually obvious um, that there's anything that's, that's awry with it. Um, and in this case, we're going to, uh, sorry, I, we're getting an alert about the Bobcat fire. Um, yeah, so you might want to pay attention to this, Ron. Um, so now we're looking at, uh, at Raven Light before we were using uh, Audacity. Um, so in this particular figure, the sonogram is the one on the bottom with all these funky colors, and the thing at the top is the amplitude or the volume. And so I'm going to change the, um, the sonogram from colors to grayscale. There's that. And then I'm going to zoom it in like that. So I've zoomed it in in frequency or pitch, and now I'm zooming it in in time. And I'm going to change the brightness and also the contrast. And the amplitude up here, that's not particularly useful to us at the moment, so we're going to get rid of that. And we're going to zoom it in a little bit more. Let's see, let me do this that way. And now we're going to play it. In fact, yeah, let me do that. So this was a Cooper's hawk that was mobbing a great horned owl that was roosting in a bush down the street from my house. The, uh, the compression artifacts that I mentioned in the previous slide are things like these white spots up here. Um, and there, there are a number of them. You can see some pretty obvious ones right here, right there, 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 and there. If you had a wave file, which is uncompressed, none of that information would be missing. It would all still be there. Okay, so let's get back to the PowerPoint, and that's going to, let's see, we're going to briefly talk a little bit about some of the apps. So there are a lot of different apps you can get for smartphones that will enable you to get nice recordings. The Voice Memo app is certainly better than nothing. Um, it's pretty sensitive, but it does obtain um, compressed files that are in M4A format. And they, they have you know, information simply missing. Um, to transfer those to your computer, just use AirDrop or email it to yourself. It's generally better to use WAV files. They have, they're uncompressed. They have a lot more information. Um, they have better sound quality. So here are some of the apps that are available. Um, I've used some of these. I've used the first three. Um, the first two are the ones that I personally prefer. iTalk is nice, but unfortunately it records AIFF files. And you can't upload those to either eBird or Xenocanto. They just don't accept that format. Um, RecForge is supposed to be really good, but it's it's well, at the time I made this slide, it was available only for Android. And I don't know um, I don't know if that's available for an iPhone or not. But it, it's very highly rated. So here's another example. Um, here are two iPhone recordings of a long eared owl <coughs> that I obtained a few months ago. The one on the top was obtained using uh, the voice memo app which it's a, an M4A file, which is compressed. And the one on the bottom, obtained a few minutes later, was using the Rode Rec app, uh, which is uncompressed. 
Now, if you just look at these, they look pretty darn similar. They, 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 well, vertically, and in terms of frequency, they cover a very similar range from 0 to 3,000 hertz in both figures. The amount of time they, they, they cover is somewhat different. Um, the difference, though, is that the information at the higher frequencies in the voice memo phone, a lot of it is simply gone. It's just white. There's just not much there. Whereas the one from the Rode Rec app, which was a WAV file, is still there. There's definitely still something there. So now we're going to try to play the, the recording on the bottom. It's kind of soft, and so you're going to have to listen carefully um, in order to hear this. Um, so using the phone by itself was, was good enough to get a usable recording of a long-eared owl, a distance of about 20 or 30 meters. But it's not a very loud recording. Uh, an external microphone could really help with this. So here we're going to play part of this. And in this case, the sonogram is not scrolled. So this has been amplified considerably to make it easier to hear it. But you, you can clearly see that there's definitely a recording of the bird um, visible there in the sonogram. So the Voice Record uh, Pro app, um, there are a couple versions of it. Um, down here at the bottom are some of the screens that it, uh, that it has that allow you to uh, you know, monitor the volume, um, sift through the different recordings you have, toggle how you want to decide how you want to send it to your own computer, how you can do various things with the file. Um, this, this is the most capable app for a phone that I'm personally familiar with. There might be others that are even better. Um, again, these, these are for uh, apps on a phone. Um, this can record several different sound formats, and it can also let you convert from one to the other. Which, which can, in principle, be quite useful. And it enables you to do some simple editing, which the Rode Rec app does not. That one just records, but it, you can't like change the volume and so forth. So this is a pretty good one, and it's less than $10. Um, there are other apps that can record, although they're not really specifically designed for that. Um, here are three apps that are really designed to identify sounds based on what you're hearing. Um, Song Sleuth, Bird Song ID, and Bird Genie. There are probably others available now, but they, um, at the time I put this together a few months ago, these were the ones I was able to, uh, to, uh, to find pretty easily. They're all inexpensive, um, and so they enable you to record song, songs, and they also, some of them show a sonogram as you record, which is really pretty nifty. And then they, they have, basically the software uses the sound that you're recording to try to identify the species. Now, this doesn't work for everything. And you have to have a pretty loud recording in order to, to, to get, you know, some reliable results. But, but they also enable you, you to record things. So in addition to the apps that I just mentioned, here are some other ones that will not only record them, but also try to identify them for you. Um, I would also point out that the one in the middle, Birdsong ID, was developed in part by Tom Stevenson, whom uh, many of you may remember, uh, visited this area a few years ago to, he and Scott Whittle, to talk about their book, The Warbler Guide. Um, which, uh, in collaboration with uh, Catherine Hamilton, was published, I think, in 2013. They, they have a really nice workshop and presentation at Pasadena Audubon that year. So, again, here's a, so, the, so those, those were the apps for phones. Here are the apps for computers. Um, so, for those of you who are wondering about what the names of these things are, um, we're going to put the presentation up on the website afterwards, so you can go ahead and look it over and see what these are. In addition, um, another thing you could do if you really want to see it now would be to pull out your phone or some camera and take a picture of your screen um, while I'm talking, so you have a record of, of, of what these are. Um, so there are a number of, of, uh, of programs available that enable you to work with, with sound files, to edit them, to amplify them, to trim them, and so forth. Um, here are some of the better known ones. Um, so we've already done a little bit with Raven Light and Audacity. We've tinkered with those a little bit with the recordings I've played for you. There are some other ones here um, which I haven't used. Um, Raven Pro is a really nice one. It's expensive, but it's very capable. Uh, Raven Light is like a, a, a simple version of Raven Pro. Adobe Audition is very, very capable. It's also expensive. Um, Raven Pro is several hundred dollars. However, if you, if you happen to be a Cornell alum, um, or a Cornell student or a member of the staff there, you can get it for free. You just have to email them. So we're going to uh, go through some examples of those in, in a moment. So Raven Light is, if, if you're just new to, uh, to editing sound, 
I would start with this. It's free. Uh, it's easy to install. You do have to set up an account at, uh, at the Cornell Lab in order to get the software. But it's, it's straightforward to install it. Um, takes just a couple minutes. And it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to use. It has some very nice visualization capabilities. Um, the original version of it used to generate a sonogram automatically when you loaded the file. Now you have to click on a couple of things to see it. Um, it works with certain formats, um, MP, oops, sorry, MP3s, WAV files, and AIFF files. Um, however, there are some files that it can't import. It, it cannot import M4A files, which is kind of a drag, because those are the ones that the Voice Memo app on your smartphone produces. And it can't import any, movie, any movies that have sound on them. Um, it's strange because the original version of Raven Light could do that, but the current one can't. So that means that if you get a, a video with, uh, say, an iPhone movie, you can't import it into Raven Light. You've got to use something else, like Audacity. Um, in addition, it, it, can, it can output WAV files, but it can't output MP3 files. So if you import some kind of file and you want to export it, you can't do MP3. That's because there, there's a particular patent for the uh, generation of MP3 files. Um, and at the time Raven Light was produced, that patent had not expired yet. Now it has. So many other programs now do export MP3s. But Raven Light is a little bit older, so it doesn't. Um, there's no manual for Raven Light, but you can use the one for Raven Pro that covers everything in Raven Light. I uh, will say, however, the manual for Raven Pro, par parts of it are very technical. And, and if you don't have a strong engineering background, they can be kind of confusing. So let's go back and, and uh, do another quick perusal of, of Raven Light. Um, so we're going back to our Cooper's Hawk recording again. So when we first looked at it, it looked kind of like this, a uh, different color scheme. But So what this is showing at the top is basically the amplitude of the sound as a function of time, and on the bottom is a sonogram. And so I personally prefer black and white or grayscale sonograms. Um, all the funky colors don't really do it for me, so I usually do that in grayscale. And you can adjust how much of the frequency or pitch part that you want to see. So you can zoom into lower and lower frequencies like that, <clears throat> or higher ones. And in this case, because it was using a, the Voice Memo app, you can see how it just, just flat out truncates above a certain level. There's just no information. And in general, up here at the higher frequencies, where there's still some of the recording, there's, there are a lot more compression losses, a lot more artifacts. Um, and using this part over here, you can zoom in or zoom out in, in time. And then the, the bar at the bottom lets you slide back and forth. Um, you could do some other nifty things with this. I mean, in addition to playing it you know, like that, as we did before, you could speed it up. So if you wanted to hear it, say, two times faster, you could just type in the number two there and then let it rip. And it makes a Cooper's Hawk sound kind of like a chipmunk or a red squirrel um, by speeding it up. Um, or you could slow it down and um, say here at half the speed. So this is going to sound different, quite different. So that's what a Cooper's Hawk sounds like at half speed. Um, you can do a number of other things with it. You can, um, well, let's see, if we go to edit, we can amplify things. So we can make the sound, say, three times louder. And you, you'll notice that the amplitude on the, on the top part got louder. Um, that is, the vertical part expanded. And so now if we play this, it's going to sound louder. <laughs> Um, you can you can also do things like select certain parts of the file, and uh, and like damp them out. Um, so if we go to, uh, let's see, how do I want to do this? You can do things like this, and then you can just kind of truncate it. So basically, it just got rid of everything at higher frequencies than the part that I highlighted. And so if we now play this, we're just picking up the bottom frequencies. And so you can, you can manipulate this in lots of different ways. 
So all sound editing software can do simple things like this. Now, there are a lot of other options. You can see them over here on the left. However, it's getting a little bit late, so I want to move along and go on to other topics before we run out of time. So let's, um, let's go back to, um, oh, how about this? This is going to be, uh, we're going to see an example of, let's see, let's get rid of that. If I can find it, I've got a number of screens up here. This is going to be Audacity with a recording of the California quail that I got last week in Rubio Canyon. So uh, let's, uh, let's play a little bit of the recording and then we're going to do a couple things to it. So there, was also, there were also some insects in there and uh, a very loud mockingbird. So the scroll bar at the bottom lets you go back and forth in time. You can use these buttons up here to zoom in in time. If you want to change how much of, you, of the uh, pitch that you see, this is where it's a little bit more cumbersome. You have to go up to the preferences and type in some number. So we'll make it 5,000 hertz. And then you'll see it zoomed in. Um, or if you wanted to change the level of detail that's visible, you also would do that using this. Uh, for example, change that number. This is manipulating a mathematical function called a fast Fourier transform for those of you who are inclined to have mathematical or engineering backgrounds. Um, and so that can be useful depending on the kind of detail you want to see. So one of the things that, we, that I was hoping we could do with this um, in addition to just showing you some of the simple things that this can do, and, and, and as, as was the case with Raven Light, you can also use this to, to selectively filter out low frequency sounds or high frequency sounds. Um, but something else we're also going to do is, uh, in, the, in the time that remains, I'm going to show you how to turn this into something you could upload into Xeno Canto. So we're going to copy part of this. I'm just going to drag it along here. We're going to copy uh, a section of this. Um, why don't we stop right about here, because after that you're going to hear other stuff. Um, I just did copy, and I'll stop sharing with that, and I'll share another screen. So here's a blank, um, a blank Audacity screen. I'm just doing a Command V, so I just pasted it in there. Now. Um, in this particular recording, it recorded uh, two different channels. That's why you see the same thing top and bottom. If I do this, it'll generate a sonogram. Um, with this particular recorder, it was set to record um, mono, not stereo. So both channels are the same thing. Uh, so I normally just kind of zoom in on one of those. And then to prepare this to upload to Xeno Canto, you export it as an MP3 file. And so um, we're going to call this uh, so I can type. And so it's just saving this as an MP3. There it goes. Easy enough. So if we stop the share with that and then share it with Xeno Canto, which I have on a web browser. We're going to do that. So you should now be seeing uh, a Xeno Canto website. I'm, I'm already logged in, so we're going to upload a sound, that one we just got. So this is going to bring up a map which is connected to, uh, to Google Maps. You just zoom it in. All these blue things you see are places where I've uploaded recordings to Xeno Canto previously. The other markers that are pale gray are places where other people have uploaded recordings to Xeno Canto. Um, Rubio Canyon is right there. Um, I have two spots there, one spelled incorrectly. Let's choose the one that's spelled properly. And so we selected the location. And now we type in the name of the species. And it brings it up. I'm going to upload the file. Let's see, it's over here. And that was California quail. So Right there, there's the file. Uh, turns out that I got this recording on August 31st. I just happened to remember that at 
1945. Uh, this was bird calling. Background species, there was a mockingbird. Uh, we're going to rate this at B. Bird seen? No, I didn't see it. It was in the bushes. Did I use playback? No. I can put in some comments. Oops. And then I'll hit next. It gives you the option to enter some other technical information, but it doesn't require it. Um, you know, length of call, volume, and so forth. We'll skip that. I don't usually do that part. And then it will let you review it. And if everything looks okay, then you hit finish. And it submits it. And then it says, hey, it's been submitted. Here's a link to the recording. So I'm going to click on that. It'll bring it up. Here it is. And if I hit this, it'll play it. And it sometimes takes a moment to load. And there it is. Now, unlike eBird or un unlike uh, Raven Light or Audacity, um, Xenocanto does not use a scrolling sonogram, unfortunately. But it does do many other wonderful things. So I think at this point, let me go back to the PowerPoint. We're getting a little bit kind of late, so I don't want to go too long. But um, so we've, we've, we've tinkered around a little bit with, with uh, Raven Light. We've tinkered around a little bit with Audacity. Um, I've already said most of this. Audacity is more complicated than Raven Light, but, but it can do a lot more. Um, it's, it's worth the effort to install it and use it. it, it that's the software that I use most. Um, I want to say some things about how to get better recordings. Um, first and foremost, get closer to the bird. Um, that's really the most fundamental thing. The, the, basically, the volume of, of sound goes as one over the distance squared. So if you cut the distance in half, the sound will be four times louder. Get closer to the bird. That's the number one thing to do. Um, try to record in places that are reasonably quiet. That can be difficult in Los Angeles, although it's a little bit easier during the pandemic because there aren't as many planes going overhead. Um, you know, don't talk. Don't shuffle your feet. Try not to, you know, record in windy conditions. Sometimes you have no choice. Um, if, it is, if it is loud, maybe you can, like, put yourself around the corner of a building or behind a car to muffle the sound a little bit. Um, try not to have too much handling noise, like the sound of Kathy with the pots and pans in the background right now. Um, avoiding handling noise takes some, some practice and, and being aware, and that, that comes with experience. It's a good idea to play back your recordings quickly to make sure everything's okay. Uh, make sure you didn't mess up some setting or there wasn't some sound in the background like a dog barking that you didn't notice. Um, also, it can be difficult to get good recordings when you're out with groups of people. Um, it's, just, it's just harder, you know, you want to socialize and so forth. Um, some other recordings, um, some of the apps and especially the dedicated recorders have a, a low cut filter. That's worth turning on. That will help reduce the rumble of low frequency sounds like, like wind and planes and cars and so on. Um, crank up the sensitivity and the gain. Um, you can adjust that manually on the Voice Record Pro app on a phone, for example. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, record wave files. It's a good idea to sample it at 48 kilohertz uh, and 24 bits. That gives you really good sound quality and it will let you see really rapidly changing features in, as the bird vocalizes. Like if there's a trill by, say, a black chin sparrow or a Buick strand. You'll be able to see it better than if you didn't sample that fast. Um, disable automatic gain because that'll that, that'll mess up with the recordings. It'll change the volume without your knowledge and then it, it, it'll really mess things up. Um, in addition, try to avoid making sounds yourself. And it, it is surprisingly easy to sneeze, cough, burp, and fart. So try not to do that. Um, I know that sounds a little silly, but I have a number of recordings of things like that. Um, so a little bit about sound formats. Um, I recommend doing WAV files. Um, some of the inexpensive apps can do those. The voice memo app that comes on iPhones can't. Um, here are some other ones. FLAC, I don't have any experience with that. That's a compressed format. M4A, that's what the voice memo app on iPhones does. It's better than nothing, but it's not as good as WAV. Um, MP3, that's not as badly compressed as M4A. 
but it is still somewhat compressed. Um, most sound files, like for music, are MP3s, for example. Um, eBird will accept WAVs, MP3s, and M4As. It will not accept AIFFs, which the iTalk app produces. Um, Xenocanto is much more restricted. It accepts only MP3 files. That's why, with the example we went through, I saved the file as an MP3. If I tried to upload a WAV file, it would choke on it, and I would get an error message. Um, so videos, there are a couple different common formats, MOVs, AVIs. If you use Audacity, you can generate a sonogram um, using these. If you use Raven Light, you can't. But they're better than nothing. And um, so people fairly often will send me movie files, and I'll send them back an MP3 file that they'll upload to Zeno Canto or eBird. Um, it's, if you have nothing else, shoot a video, and we can pull the sound off of it. It does definitely work. Um, in terms of uploading your recordings, um, I've already said some of this about, you know, different formats that they can use. And since it's running late, I'm going to basically skip over this because um, I want to get to why you might want to do this, why you might want to contribute to Zeno, Kant, and eBird. I mean, their broad goals are to, for education, enjoyment, science, and conservation. Um, you, when you upload recordings to, to eBird, they go into the Macaulay Library of Sounds at, the Cornell, at Cornell University. Um, this is an, you know, a, a, a long-standing facility, and they have excellent institutional support. And they're like museum specimens, each of these sound recordings. Um, they're used extensively by researchers worldwide. It's fun to contribute. It's a great way to learn things. A lot of people see these when they're looking at eBird lists. However, everyday users cannot download the sound files. Um, eBird is not configured for that. Researchers, yes, but you have to email them and request them. With Zeno Canto, um, it's an archive based in the Netherlands. It's supported by a, a nonprofit foundation and the uh, Naturalis Biodiversity Center, which is a major natural history museum. So again, excellent institutional support. It's a lot easier to look for files, sound files, than it is on eBird. You can download them if you want to. Um, you can put them on your smartphone. You can play around with them. And th as a result, files that I personally have uploaded to Xenocanto are used a lot more extensively than the ones that I've uploaded to eBird. Um, so it's a more effective way to get your, your sound files utilized by people all over the world. So we've already gone through some examples. And I think at that point, since it's a few minutes after 9, we're going to stop. And, excuse me, after 8, 8 o'clock, not 9 o'clock. And uh, we're going to save the rest of uh, the presentation for next week's session, uh, next Tuesday night. And so I guess with that, um, do we have questions? I guess there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Yeah. Well, first of all, very that was great, Lance. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a comment on the chat, and I I apologize, Hope, but from Hope Kennelly, um, she points out that there's a setting in Voice Memo that you uh, that you can set your audio quality to either lossless or compressed. And just to let you know and let other people know. Yeah. And so. so Go ahead. Right. So, so some of the apps give you the option of choosing. The, the Voice Memo app on my phone does not, but <laughs> yeah, the Rode Rec and, and Voice Record, you can do, you can do, you know, M4As or Waves or MP3s. Um, let's see. So I'm bringing up some of the chats. Uh, some of the Q's and A's, you mean? Yeah, Rode Rec um, is spelled R-O-D-E and then R-E-C. Um, Rodi is a, or Roda is a, a company in, in Scandinavia that primarily builds uh, microphones and recorders, but they also uh, do software. <coughs> we're we're going to post the PowerPoint on the website. We'll be able to scroll through the slides and, and pull that out, um, as well as the names of the different software. Um, for the quail, um, so Mike's question about the, the California quail. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk next week, uh, during next week's uh, session, next Tuesday night, about dedicated recorders. Um, so here is the recorder I use for that. This is a little Sony recorder. It's uh, the PCM M10. That was the thing that I typed into the info on the, um, when I uploaded the recording to Zeno Canto. So I use this, this recorder, and now it's turned on. But I had an external microphone. We'll say a lot more about this next week. But here's the microphone. Let's see. Let me back up a little bit so you can so you can actually see this. 
So yeah, here's the microphone. So this is an 18 inch shotgun microphone. It's a Sennheiser ME67 model. <laughs> and it just plugs in to the recorder like that. And then you're ready to go. So we'll talk a lot about this a lot more next week. Um, that, that's the standard setup that I use when I'm going hiking or if I'm traveling because it's very portable. Um, uh, Justina, thank you very much for your kind words. Um, let's see. And I recommend my orders. Yeah, that's next week. Um, so Norm's question, what's the topic next week? The topic next week is more advanced stuff. We're going to be talking about external microphones. We're going to be talking about dedicated sound recorders. Um, connecting external microphones to uh, phones, um, how you go about doing that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about sound loggers, automatic sound loggers, things like song meters. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, the sensitivity pluses and minuses of the different kinds of microphones and, and so forth. Um, so let's see, John's question about evening grow speaks. So, yeah, we're probably going to do another talk at some point on evening gross peaks and red cross bills. Um, so there, there currently are five populations of evening gross peaks that have been identified so far. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there are actually are more. They've been identified by their flight calls. Um, here in Southern California, we've identified, that is recorded and identified, two of the five, types one and two. Um, type two is actually nest here in California, up in the central Sierra Nevada. Types one don't. Um, for Red Cross bills, 11 different um, populations have been identified in North America um, so far. In North America, in this case, means everything north of, say, Nicaragua. Um, and there's pretty strong evidence that there's going to be a 12th in the Northeast. Um, cross bills in northern New England and you know, northern New York that are commonly referred to as Eastern Type 10, pretty good evidence that those are actually going to be Type 12s, completely new type. Um, stay tuned for more on that. Um, so I think I think with that, let's see. Uh, Mark, uh, Ron, do you have uh, other things you want to say? I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, no, I I think we're running out of questions in chat. Uh, Lance, thank you again very very much. It was a great evening. Uh, just to remind everyone, uh, part two of Lance's talk will be next Tuesday at seven o'clock. Same place, same time. I will actually send a new uh, uh, link to uh, to sign up for it. So um, stay tuned for that. If you are on this link, if you are, excuse me on this webcast, you will get an invitation to register. Uh, Mark, is there anything I'm missing? No, that's it. Thank you very much, Lance, and we're looking forward to next week. <laughs> Yeah, so I know there's one more question from, <coughs> excuse me, from Norm. Oh, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little bit next week. Um, um, the equipment that I have is, is, is mostly Sennheiser's, but yeah, I mean, Audio Technica, Rody, you know, they, they make uh, microphones too. Wildtronics does, they, they make mics, they make dishes. Uh, Talinga also makes mics in addition to dishes. We'll, we'll talk about that more next week. Great. All right. And with that, thank you all very much. And we will see all of you next week. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Lance. Thanks again, Lance. Bye, everybody.